When I was in college, I had a summer job, and because I was a math major and kind of a big nerd, uh, my summer job was working in a bio lab where I was supposed to figure out how many people on Earth were going to have tuberculosis in the year 2050. So that was my job. So how do you do this? So my boss gave me a giant pile of papers, every paper he had about tuberculosis. I mean, whatever you can imagine, the transmission rate and the medical compliance rate and the survival curves, and all this stuff broken down by age and race and sex and HIV status. I mean, a big folder, lots of papers. And uh, what did I do? Well, I did what math majors do, which is I made a model. I put all this information together, I put it in the computer, and I ran it year by year, decade by decade, until I got to 2050. And at the end of that, I had a number. And I gave the number to my boss, and I got paid. And that was the end of my summer job. <laughs> but it's not the end of the story. Uh, I think I mentioned I was a big nerd, and so even though the summer was over and I'd already been paid, I kept thinking about tuberculosis, and I kept thinking about those papers. And the thing is that each number in those papers had a certain amount of uncertainty around it. Right, like maybe it says in some context the transmission rate of tuberculosis is 20%. But what does that mean? It means we know it's not 0%. And we know it's not 60%. But there's some room. Maybe it's 13%. Maybe it's 25%. There's a range in which we can move. And what I realized is that each one of those papers had a certain amount of uncertainty in it. And when you put those uncertainties together in the model, they multiplied on each other and they fed back into each other year by year, decade by decade, until, by 2050, the noise had totally engulfed the signal. By turning those knobs, by moving around in the uncertain range, I could make it so that nobody had tuberculosis in the year 2050, or I could make it so that the entire world was infected with tuberculosis in 2050. I had no idea. And so what I learned was that the answer to a math question is not always a number. Sometimes the answer is, I don't know. And what's somewhat painful about this experience, actually, is that I know that my boss went around and told lots of people, this is how many people in the world are going to be infected with tuberculosis in the year 2050. This many million. And if somebody asked him, how do you know that? He would have said, well, I hired a guy, and he did the math. <laughs> OK, so when I think about this story, I often think about, so stay with me here, a famous speech by Theodore Roosevelt, which I'm going to take out now. I give you a little piece of. So this speech is called Citizenship of the Republic, but it's often known as the Man in the Arena speech. I'm just going to give you a small piece that goes like this. It is not the critic who counts. Who knows it? You guys know this? Anybody see this show on Facebook? It's very popular. Uh, it is not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. OK, so this is something that you quote if you really want to get people revved up and motivated. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Theodore's cousin, uses this in his last speech of his 1936 campaign. Uh, and Richard Nixon uses it when he's resigning the presidency in 1974. Um, Brene Brown quotes this in her TED talk, Daring Greatly, which has been seen by over 4 million people. So it's a great speech. <laughs> but what I learned from my summer job is that Theodore Roosevelt is not exactly right. <laughs> so to explain that, let me tell another story. Uh, and this is the story of Abraham Wall. It's another mathematician. Uh, a refugee from Austria, he flees when the Nazis take over, comes to the United States. And during World War II, he's working in a top secret lab, the Statistical Research Group, or an SRG. Um, and this is a lab that's near Columbia University, where some of the top mathematicians and statisticians in the United States are working together on problems related to the war. So it's, it's kind of like the Manhattan Project, except it's actually in Manhattan. <laughs> so one day, a group of generals comes to the SRG, with a problem. And here's the problem has to do with how much armor to put on the planes. You see, why is this hard? If you put too much armor on a plane, it won't fly. So that's bad. If you put too little, it gets shot down. Also bad. So the generals needed to figure out exactly how much armor to put on the plane and where. 
Because you see, the generals had noticed something rather strange. When they looked at the planes that were coming back from Germany, that were coming back from their bombing runs, they saw that the bullet holes were not evenly distributed over the planes. Some parts of the plane had more, some had less. There were more bullet holes in the fuselage, there were less bullet holes in the engine. And so the generals came to Abraham Wall and the mathematicians of the SRG with a question. They said, how much more armor should we be putting on the places where the planes are getting hit more? Is there like a formula for this? Is there like a number you can give us? Is there an answer? And what Abraham Wall told them is no. You've got this wrong. You need to put the armor where the bullet holes are not. Okay, so this is curious. Wall explains, you see, it's not that the Germans can't hit your planes on the engines. It's that the planes that get hit on the engines are not coming back from Germany. <laughs> These are the ones that are not in your sample. These are the ones that you're not in your study. You're asking the wrong question. So this is kind of an amazing moment that I just want to emphasize that this is really what mathematicians are trained to do. This is our job, to look at a question and say, are you even asking the right question? What assumptions are you making, and are they justified? Can they be proven? Um, what does this have to do with Theodore Roosevelt? OK. Uh, well, when I hear him sort of sneer at the cold and timid souls who are on the sideline, I think about Abraham Wall, because this is a guy who, as far as I know, never picked up a weapon in anger in his entire life. But he made a serious and material contribution to the American war effort. And he did it precisely by counseling the doers of deeds how they could do them better. Okay, He was unsweaty and undusty and unbloody. <laughs> but he was right. He was a critic who counted. Uh, to move closer to the present, um, Another hero of mine is Nate Silver. This is a guy who, um, a very popular election analyst who wrote a blog for the New York Times about 538 uh, leading up to the 2012 election now, has his own thing uh, at ESPN. And um, well, I love academia, I'm a professor, but I have to admit that Nate Silver taught more math to more American people in 2012 than probably every math professor in the country put together. So how did he do it? What did he do? Well. You guys have probably seen a political show on TV or some in-between elections, and so maybe you've forgotten. Let me remind you how it works. Uh, there's a host, and the host will have some guests, and the host will say, okay, today we're discussing the election. Who's going to win, Obama or Romney? First up, Democratic guest, who's going to win? And the Democratic guest, well, you see Obama's going to win, and here's three Democratic reasons, like one, two, three, bang, 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 done. Okay, the host, over to you, Republican guest. Who's going to win this election? The Republican guest says, Romney's going to win. Here's three Republican reasons why. Bang, bang, bang. One, two, three. OK, that's how it usually looks. Oh, we've all watched these shows. How does it look when Nate Silver is on? It looks a little bit different, because the host will say, Nate Silver, master statistical guru, who's going to win this election? And Nate Silver will say, you know what? We don't know who's going to win. Either guy could win. Obama might win. Romney might win. Now, I can say that based on what we know right now, Obama is more likely to win than Mitt Romney. Maybe I'll say today, based on all the data we have, there's a 75% chance that Obama's going to win, or a 60% chance, or an 85% chance, whatever. The important thing is that I'm going to give you a range, and I'm going to tell you that we don't know, and I'm going to tell you what I can tell you. The host hated this. <laughs> hated it. They thought he was cheating. They were like, why won't you just commit to something? Why won't you just give us an answer? And what they did not get is that Nate Silver was giving them an answer. More than that, he was giving them the right answer. Because to the really interesting questions that we face, the answer is usually not yes or no. The answer is usually I don't know. And we don't have to stop there, because thanks to the efforts of many of the smartest people on the planet over the last few hundred years, we have a mathematical theory of probability. We have a precise way to talk about our uncertainty. And that's exactly what Nate brought to bear uh, on this problem, uh, and exactly what he was able to teach uh, to readers of the New York Times and now readers of his site at ESPN on the large scale. So, I think about Abraham Wall, I think about Nate Silver, but actually maybe who I think about most when I think about this Teddy Roosevelt speech is a poet, the great American poet John Ashbery. So I'm going to read you one more thing. I'm going to read you a piece of 
Probably Ashbery's most famous poem, Soonest Mended. This is from 1966. Um, I wish I could read the whole poem, but I'm just going to read the end, so it's kind of a spoiler, sorry. <laughs> so here's how it ends, Soonest Mended. And you see, both of us were right, though nothing has somehow come to nothing. The avatars of our conforming to the rules and living around the home have made, well, in a sense, good citizens of us, brushing the teeth and all that, and learning to accept the charity of the hard moments as they are doled out. For this is action, this not being sure, this careless preparing, sowing the seeds crooked in the furrow, making ready to forget, and always coming back to the mooring of starting out that day so long ago. I'm going to say it again. For this is action, this not being sure. It's a sentence I repeat to myself like a mantra. We need the Teddy Roosevelt's. We need the doers of deeds, but we also need the questioners, the hesitators, the doubters, the congenitally unsure. <laughs> we need them, and Ashbury even kind of denies the distinction between them. This is action, this not being sure. To, to the extent that we can, we need to strive to be both at once, to hear that voice that says go and listen to it, but also listen to that voice that says, but what about not yes, not no, but I don't know. That's the answer to a lot of questions, the most interesting and the most important questions that we face. And we don't have to stop with saying I don't know. We need to say I don't know in a loud voice. We need to say I don't know with confidence. We need to say I don't know, and this is what I would have to know in order to know. And we need to say I don't know, and you don't know either. <laughs> And this is the precise numerical extent to which neither of us know. We don't always have to be critics, but when we do, we have to be critics who count. Thank you.